Welcome to Game Changers Live from Miami, Florida. My name is Sergio Tijera. I'm your host. And each and every week, we bring you someone who has been a game changer in their field and who's touched the lives of thousands to get their perspective on their journey, their mindset, their struggles and successes so that we can inspire you on your journey. So let's get started right now. And welcome to Game Changers Live from Miami, Florida. My name is Sergio Tijera. I'm your host. And each and every week we have game changers in their field. And this week is no exception. Thank you so much for being a part of our community. Game Changers Live is now a top 2% podcast rated globally by Listen Notes. And we are now coming to you live from the FIU studios in the College of Communications, Architecture and the Arts. And this week we got my buddy, Eric Galen. Welcome, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Great awesome. to be here. Awesome. So Eric, Eric is a an attorney by trade, but he is a game changer in the field because of so many things that he gets involved with. And that's why we brought him on the show. A lot of great stories. And we're going to talk about some of these things that are game changing events that can happen in your life and much more. So Eric, tell me a little bit about your background, brother. Absolutely. So I uh, grew up in Northern California, San Francisco Bay Area. And I uh, grew up uh, as an uh, aspiring uh, artist, aspiring musician. And uh, my dad uh, scared me straight. <laughs> went down to uh, Los Angeles for college and law school. And when I got out, I started uh, started in corporate law. So I started helping people build businesses, fund businesses, things like that. Um, but you know, being a creative growing up, I was always really passionate about the arts and entertainment. So I started uh, working in entertainment as well, which... For a lawyer, is very unusual because typically, you the the practices in law are very siloed. So, mm. if you are a corporate lawyer, you're not an entertainment lawyer, generally speaking, and vice versa. Um, and most firms and most groups don't really um, they don't have people that really do both. So, for example, you know, finding a lawyer that could negotiate a, a content deal or a producer deal, a record label deal, that lawyer probably cannot form an LLC and help you with a safe note and funding and, and things like that. Right. So I just, you know, back at that time, I just thought, well, these, I think creating companies and then, and doing things within media and entertainment are both, um, are important. And I saw these two things as really converging and, uh, uh but, but it was definitely hard, uh, it was it was hard to find a place where I could do that with a group that understood what I was because I was kind of a I was kind of like the weird cousin that did uh, you know weird <laughs> stuff that other people didn't necessarily totally get. Um, uh, what that's become now is a practice that you know I work with a lot of uh, Web three companies. I work with founders. I work with investors. I work with. At the end of the day, I work with. I like helping people build things. Right. All so right. sometimes I do that as a lawyer. Uh, sometimes I do that as an advisor, or I've also done it in the past as a venture catalyst or as a um, even managing. So it kind of, I, growing up as a musician, I played a lot of jazz, and I, I used to go to Stanford University. I was always the youngest kid. You don't look like a jazz guy. For I, know, I, don't, I don't look like You look more I, like I, a football player. Like so. <laughs> I didn't look like this at all. I was, uh, su if you can imagine, super skinny, long hair, um, yeah, very different. Really? Vibe. Yeah, very different. Vibe. Right. But I did. Uh, I played jazz and and this amazing uh, instructor that I had at Stanford University, I would go to this workshop every summer. And he really kind of ingrained in me, like when you're in a band, it's you've got to, it's got to be about the song and it's got to be about the band. It's not about you. Mm. So sometimes you're playing background. Sometimes you're soloing. Sometimes you're just writing the song and you're not, not even on stage. And sometimes you're in the audience and you're watching and you have to know when to be which right and and not let your ego get in the way and that relates a lot to life right because sometimes you're Everything. you're you're behind the scenes sometimes you got to be up on stage knowing your role and when to play it it's super important in your success absolutely and you know whether whether you are the one who's being changed or you're the game changer right understanding trying to see what you're doing and what others are doing and how it all fits in on a macro level and trying to take yourself and your ego out of the equation and say, how can I best help this song, this group, this experience? Um, it's hugely important. So you were out in, in LA 
<clears throat> in a very you know music oriented kind of background a city that's that's all about music entertainment stuff like that mm -hmm. being up on uh, on stage you started working with some musicians and some some uh, some actors and and, well, and some and, other and famous a lot of, people and a lot of startups right so back okay. in in the 2000s is when the silicon beach la had its <clears throat> la was going through what miami started kind of really going through a couple of years right. ago where it was really this influx of capital and founders and tech and and there was this moment where things really started building and um so I was working with uh, founders and what I found was that working with creatives like artists or talent and mm -hmm. working with founders were they were just two sides of the same coin, right? Oh, They're all trying to find product market fit. They're all trying to find funding. They all need teams. They all need guidance. Um, they're all trying to create something. And so I saw a lot of commonality. There's a lot of common energy there and there's a lot of common drive and, and vision and um, fear and insecurity, and all the other good and bad mm. things that go along with trying to create something that doesn't already exist, not taking the safe, well-traveled path. Right. Um, so, so as I worked with these two groups, I started doing um, more and more in the space after about six or seven years at kind of more traditional firms, uh, I left to go work in-house um which means I, you know i was working as attorney inside a company and uh it was there that i got my real world mba as i mm -hmm. say so i got very familiar with you know financial projections and pitch decks and fundraising and and really helped the company um take a quantum step forward and i realized why wow, I'm, I'm actually good at this and I, I really like it it was not anything i had done previously yeah. i didn't i didn't think of myself as an entrepreneurial person really i mean i thought of i always thought of myself as you know i'm gonna Go be a doctor or a lawyer and i'm going to provide services and that's, you know, that's what i'm going to do so um having that experience was really pivotal for me it's not obvious to us that they are unusual or unique because it seems like an everyday thing to you right because you're good at it and <clears throat> typically it takes either experiences or other people or family or friends to say hey you're amazing at this or you know what you did here was really incredible yeah. and when you start paying attention to those things you can start identifying hey these are actually i have a unique a unique genius over in this area and i should maybe pursue it i should try to integrate it and that's you know th that's a really that's a really powerful thing that you're saying because and, and i tell this to and i believe this with everybody that everyone has some genius inside of them they don't always see it and sometimes it it takes others to see it for them right and as as a coach i love that because i can see the potential in people and show it to them and and then you see them flourish and shine one of the things i always tell people is is to follow the breadcrumbs meaning like life leaves you clues right when you start looking at the things that you've been doing well and that comes easy to you like it like you said it seems normal but it's not normal for everybody it's not normal for everybody and and particularly if your if your unique genius isn't um doesn't fall in is it's not something that the systems typically discover so for example you know if you're growing up you know i grew up in northern california right if you're growing up in northern california and you're good at baseball or football the system figures that out right if you're good at math mm -hmm. the system figures that out if you're good at other things that that aren't necessarily academic or or sports related within those sports right um system doesn't figure it out and so it's really up to you to figure it out mm. and you know I, so do you think you need to be in the right setting the right environment the right atmosphere the right place like that's what actors go out to la to to be discovered so to speak so that the system can pick them up and if you're not in that space should you be trying to get into that space uh yes yes and no i think i think that that space has used to be much more geographically limited mm -hmm. right so if you wanted to be a musician for example you really had to be in new york or LA or nashville right now with technology and with social media and whatnot you i i don't want to say you can be anywhere because at some point you're probably going to have to go to some some other areas but but for the most part, you can record, you can create, you can distribute, you can promote from anywhere in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Tech has decentralized so much of what yeah. we do. Um, but I do think, I think to your point, what's important is that you're in and around an environment that will nurture you. Um, if you have negativity around you, or if you have mm. people that are limited, and by the way, most of the time that's 
your family, your school, your friends, your, family, your parents, your, your parents, your brothers, sisters, your old friends. Yeah, and, and not because they not because they they mean badly, but because everybody has a set of stories. Everybody has programming from when you're mm -hmm. little, from your experiences, from everything else, from society, from what you've watched, what you've learned, um, what is possible, what isn't possible. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like the it's like the story about the guy, you know, no one had run a sub four minute mile until yeah. one guy did. And then everybody realized that that could be done. And yeah. suddenly people start doing it. Yeah. So for the most part, in terms of if you really want to if you want a game changing event to happen. And by the way, I think I actually wrote an article. I had a music startup in 2010. Um, and, you know, we raised money and launched this product and, and had actually discovered some talent and had some success with it. Um, but I wrote an article about the fact that um, progress in career, life, anything, it's typically not linear. Yeah. They're typically these quantum events. I would call them quantum events where, you know, when electrons, really? electrons don't slowly move from one orbit to another, they jump. Right. And typically that's what happens with people's careers, right? You have these game changing events. It's meeting the right person that you might not have even realized mm -hmm. you were meeting or having an event happen or having something that was fortuitous or synchronicity happening. These are the kinds of things that happen. And so the more that you can surround yourself. So to your point, right? Why go to LA? It's not that LA, the land of LA has something magic. It's that by being in LA as an aspiring actor, you're more likely to encounter these game changing events, right? right people or the right agent or the right opportunity because you're in and around and increasing your chances. Happen. You're just increasing the, the chances. But you still have to be prepared. And much of that means being prepared mentally, right? So, yeah. you know, even if, even if you're presented with the right opportunity, if you don't think that you can run a sub four, four minute mile, you're not going to run a four, sub four minute mile. Right. So you have to believe and you have to be able to see where you can go. Um, and I think I think that's a really important thing for people because I think when we're particularly when we're growing up, I mean, the, the you know, have you ever you ever shot a rifle or you know, very small changes make a huge make, difference, make a huge difference downrange, right? Right. And, and so it is with life. So we have to really we have to pay so much attention to what happens early in life because small changes, small events, the beliefs that you have, mm -hmm. um, the stories that you're telling yourself, the people that you're surrounded with can really make a huge difference. I mean, I, I tell you, I, I'm, so I'll tell you, I, I don't think I've, I've never told anyone this in any kind of public setting. Um, but I think people, when people, you know, I'm, I run the innovation technology group at a big firm called Greenspan Martyr. I was introduced to them by Mayor Francis Suarez, who's a client and a friend and, and a great person. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate and blessed to be doing some really interesting things in life. And I've been able to, we'll talk about some of these, but I've worked with some really interesting people. Um, growing up, it did not look that way. Mm. Growing up, um, I nearly failed out of high school. Um, wow. I was, in retrospect, totally understimulated by most of the classes. You know, I would, I would get a, you know, a D in the most easy classes, and then I'd get an A in the most challenging English class and my parents were ready to, you know, they, they were ready to kill me. <laughs> um, the school really didn't, yeah, didn't really have any input and, 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 or understanding. And, um, so graduating, you know, when I fortunately graduated high school, um, I, I would say my parents didn't have high hopes. <laughs> I don't think, <laughs> I don't think most of my classmates right. had high hopes. Um, most likely to succeed. No, <laughs> I, definitely, definitely not. And, um, and I started, so I, so I went to junior college in Santa Barbara and when I left the environment that I was in and I left the high school I was in and I was able to start exposing myself or starting to try to start make some of my own rules. Right. I found that I actually was great at school, just not in the same capacity and not in the same environment that had been in high school. <clears throat> Right. right. So high school was very much, it was less about your ability and it was more about how well did you play by the rules? I don't play by rules right. very well. I don't, I never, I, I, I have natural, um, mm. I naturally don't love authority. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't thrive in the high school, a structured right. high school environment, but I got to college where it, they were really testing you for the most part on your finals and on what you could do and mm. how you could think. Uh, I started studying philosophy and I started studying pre-med and 
And then I started getting exceptional grades. And so I used that momentum uh, to transfer to UCLA where I graduated with honors and I was on the mortar board. And I mean, I, I had great success there. I was one of, I don't know, we had a, I was pre-med and philosophy. So in my wow. pre-med class, we had maybe 300 people in organic chemistry. Pre-med and, and of, philosophy? Yeah, it was a weird combination. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm filled with weird combinations. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, so I was one of 300 people in this organic chemistry class and, and ended up in, in high school. People, kids made fun of me because I would do so poorly in chemistry. And then organic chemistry at UCLA, which was, it was one of the big weed out classes. It was yeah. like, oh, you want to be pre-med? Get through organic chemistry. And it, were, it was it was graded on a forced curve. So they would only allow a certain number of people to get A's, A minus, B plus, you know, mm -hmm. all the way down. So the average was a C or C plus or something like that, or 350 people. And um, I ended up getting an, I think it was, I was the only A plus in the class and it was as a philosophy major. And they just, they, they almost made me retake the final because they thought I cheated or they'd messed up on the grades or something like that. <laughs> it's gotta and be I something wrong that, here, yeah. No, and I, and I don't say that to brag. Yeah. I say that because there are kids right now struggling in high school who have the potential to do amazing things. And the system oftentimes doesn't find them. And it doesn't, it doesn't identify what the issue is. It doesn't really have the capacity to help them um, and I'm not just talking about underprivileged. I, I think this exists with privileged areas, underprivileged right. areas. It exists everywhere that there are certain systems that are set up. And if you don't work well within the system, you fall outside the system. And, um, I was lucky enough to have a couple of professors that helped me kind of see the potential. And that's interesting because under stimulation, you don't think about somebody's getting bad grades. Oh, it's just because they're not stimulated enough. You think they're, they're failing because they're failing. They don't get it. They're, you know, they, they're just uh, slower or they don't understand. How do you then, how do you like as a system, how do you identify those people, those students and put them in an environment where, all right, they need to be more challenged, which seems count counterintuitive. It is counterintuitive, but it's easy to, it's easy to figure that out. So for example, when I was in high school, I had a, there was a, there was a teacher in high school that I had, Mrs. Condon, who uh, taught a really difficult English class. And everybody kind of was scared of her English class. And and um, even the kids that were on honors and whatnot were kind of intimidated by the English class. It ended up being one of the classes that I did the best in. Um, I excelled in her English class mm -hmm. because it challenged me enough that I was actually engaged and I paid attention. Most of the other classes, I was just bored. So it, it's the style of teaching, but it's also um, how how fast is it moving? How difficult is it? Yeah. If you're moving too slow, if you're moving too slow for some people, they just um, they get bored and they they disengage. They, they disengage. I disengaged. Yeah, I just totally disengaged. Um, and so I think there are ways. You know, if you have a kid who's, you know struggling in easy classes and then goes and crushes a really hard class that's a sign that's a sign yeah you're doing so something something's something's not connecting there right and i think the system owes it to the community to the students mm -hmm. to to identify and figure those things out um because there's so much talent that goes undernourished yeah you know my life could have gone a lot of different directions and um and it didn't because of a, a few key people and a few things that I think helped me see that my beliefs weren't necessarily what they need that they, I could do something beyond, I could run right. a, a sub four minute mile. Right. Right. So let's move on that. So you, you, you start having some success in, in the legal field and projects, you start getting involved with a lot of projects. You, you talk to yourself about being a connector and somebody who, who can see the potential in others. So you start working with, with some, uh, some famous people on some, on some pretty interesting projects. Tell me about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I, I think after working in house and after having my startup, I realized, okay, well, I'm, I actually love being entrepreneurial and I love helping people build things. And sometimes, sometimes you help by being a lawyer, you help with contracts or you help with structuring or setting up a company. But what I found equally and sometimes more engaging was 
helping people meet the right people, um, tell the right story. Telling the right story is critical, right? Everybody's got to be a storyteller. Mm -hmm. um, if you are an artist, a songwriter, an actor, if you're a writer, if you're a CEO pitching a company, you're a storyteller. And that's probably one of the one of the most underrated but most important traits or skills that you can develop, right? Because you're you're selling, you're always selling something, Everything. right? You're selling yourself, you're selling your product, your service, whatever it is. And it's all about stories. People remember how your stories make them feel. Right. They can imagine it. If you yeah. can do that effectively, then you're going places. You're always selling. If you're if you're trying to raise money for a company, if you're dating, if you're, <laughs> you're always selling. Especially when you're, you're dating selling. in Miami. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're always selling. So I, I think storytelling, but but learning to do it in an authentic way. Right. Right. I think I think so much when we when we hear about storytelling, I think there's so much emphasis that gets put on the outcome that people you, you get a lot of these, um, you know, you kind of hack your way to the end. Mm. I really think that I, th I think you're better off being authentic as a storyteller and, yeah. and you know, don't don't bullshit people like, you know, really try to find your authentic, authentic story and try to really communicate that and do it in a passionate way and do it, do it in a way that, that really resonates with people. And, and what I found, this was not an, an obvious path, but my background studying philosophy, which is really kind of the art of thinking, if nothing mm -hmm. else, um, teaches you how to think and then going to law school, which also refines very efficient thinking. Right. Then when I started working with startups, I realized, my gosh, I can help people tell stories. I can help them take something that's this <laughs> and confusing and, and make it simple and elegant and impactful. Mm. And sometimes that's the difference. You know, I had a client that um, had come out of an incubator in LA and was trying to raise money. And I was working with them as a lawyer and, and doing their documents. And they, you know, I said, what's, what's been going on with the fundraising? He said, well, we're struggling. We're trying to raise a half a million. We've only got 200,000. We're really stalled. I said, send me the deck. So he sent me the deck. And I had my team look at the deck. I brought in a graphic designer. I kind of restructured some of the deck and the story, brought brought the team in and said, you should tell the story this way. He calls me back two weeks later. He's like, we're oversubscribed. We didn't do anything different with the business. There's nothing different with the tech. We've wow. raised over half a million. We're opening up another round. And it was all about the story. It was just the story. So how you tell your story and working with people that can help you tell a great story mm -hmm. and tell an impactful way is hugely important. And, yeah. and he's gone on to be a really successful entrepreneur. Um, but there was, you know, again, it was those quantum, there's that time where he was kind of heading toward failing and yeah. then got to success uh, because oftentimes these are small changes. They're not even yeah. massive changes. It's tweaks, right? you know? Um, sometimes you have to make a bigger change. But. Do we overthink things sometimes? I mean, how do you how do you find the essence of the story? Is that just something natural that comes to you? I think I think that you you've got to be able to get to the essence of the thing. That's that's a lot of what I spent my time doing when I was studying philosophy. Is you're trying to get to the essence. You know, imagine Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. Like he's literally spent months just locked away in a cabin trying to get down imagining that there's an to, evil genius to that. confusing him and tricking him and trying to get to some <laughs> essence of what can yeah. you really know what can you be sure of right um so i think you don't need to necessarily do that but you do need to when you're when you're talking about a startup or a business you're trying to explain yourself the story trying to explain the why the who why now yeah getting to an essence that that is authentic and that resonates with people. I think people do oftentimes overthink. I see most decks, most executive summaries, most pitches are just too long and too convoluted. I mean, keep and it simple, understandable. Keep that... it simple. And but but it's hard to make it simple, right? right. We think about Albert Einstein's E equals <clears throat> MC squared. Right. It's very elegant, simple, but it it's it's not that it's that was the extremely easy thing. That profound, was really hard, and thing. deep. Yeah, there's so much that goes to really it. deep right? Really yeah. deep. That's where all the hard work is, <clears throat> is to come up with this little diamond at the end that is mm -hmm. elegant and simple and that people can see quickly and understand. Because when you're telling stories, you're trying to communicate an emotion or a vision to someone else. I want you to see in your mind and feel in your heart what I am, right? right? And we do that with words and pictures and gestures and images and tone of voice and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So as you do that, as you learn to do that, 
you become more effective. But it, but oftentimes, uh, what I found is that if you if you work with people like me that have spent a lot of time taking things that are complex and then boiling them down to very simple language, um, that's that can oftentimes really help you. Sometimes you need someone from the outside to come mm -hmm. in and say, no, "This this really is what you should be doing." Yeah. So, for example, we when I had my music startup, there was this. Um, he was maybe 16 or 17 year old, this, this kid, really, really bright kid from Fresno, which is not an entertainment capital of California. <laughs> it's, it's agriculture. And um, his parents had found me and, and had set up a meeting with me on, on Sunset Boulevard in, in Los Angeles. And he wanted to be an artist. His He was on the path of trying to become right. an artist. So he was putting music out on iTunes and do this and wasn't having a ton of success and and wasn't super comfortable on stage and whatnot. And so they wanted some advice and some help on how to be an artist. So we sat down and met and I put on my headphones and I said, play me some stuff that you've done. Mm -hmm. So he plays me this track and I'm, my jaw drops. I said, who produced this? He goes, I did. I said, who wrote it? I did. Who played the instruments? Who sang? He goes, I did. I did everything. I went, I said, you don't like being on stage? He goes, no. I said, you need to be a producer-songwriter. He's like, what's a producer-songwriter? And so I explained to him, producers and songwriters are the ones that actually are the behind the scenes, right. creating the music and the tracks and, and bringing these songs to life. <clears throat> and you do that for other people primarily. You're not the artist. You don't go on stage. You create the hits that other people use to go on stage. And... He thought I was, a, he thought I was, he thought he later told me that he didn't believe me and thought I was out of my mind and that, I, that it was complete BS. Yeah. His parents had enough faith in me and we, uh, my team and I worked with him for the following two years and fast forward, he's living in LA. He's working as a really successful producer songwriter. He's living his dream. He's really happy. Um, so sometimes it's, it's, I wasn't necessarily telling them what they wanted to hear. They wanted to know how he could be a successful artist. But from my vantage point, from an outsider who had been in and around entertainment, I realized he's really better suited to go play mm -hmm. over here, right? So it's like we talked about originally, right? Yeah. You're not really supposed to be playing the solo. You're supposed, supposed to be playing backup. And you're going to be happy. And it's that little change that you don't see yourself. But sometimes you, you bring somebody from the outside. They see something very clearly that you just completely missed. And right. then you're like, <laughs> how did right. I not see that? You right. know, we all have blind spots. And it seems obvious later on. Right. But at the time it wasn't obvious at all. And, and so that's, that's, I, I've ended up spending a lot of my life doing that for, for people, for founders, for businesses, um, helping people kind of see, I, I think I can see where people can go and what their potential is and, and what the path would be to get there Yeah, and can help guide them there. And, um, and then it really just comes down to trust. It's like, if you know you ever get up in the middle of the night your dog can see fine and if you follow your dog your dog could lead you outside and pitch black <laughs> right. you have to trust the dog the dog can see something that you can't see right um and i think that's that's that that's the interpersonal dynamic that ends up coming yeah develop a, a reputation for that right and then you start working with some other you folks to develop and... develop trust and then sometimes the trust has nothing to do with you if you're the game changer and you're trying to really help someone um if they're too you know if they're too fearful or their own beliefs are too limiting mm. they won't follow you right they just won't believe it's possible yeah. so um sometimes you also have to help people understand what those beliefs are um i spoke to someone actually at, at fiu i spoke to one of the i think it was one of the deans when i first moved to miami and i said you know I'd, I'd love to teach something around the mindset of being an entrepreneur because mm. for all of the skills you can teach people, for all of the coding, for all the business classes and accounting. probably the most important thing because it's a roller coaster. That, they've yeah. got nothing yeah. and they'll never go anywhere. I always tell people, I mean, you, you better you better strap in and, and, and check your gut because you're going to be, you know, one day you're high, one day you're just, you know, you're beating yourself up. You don't know where you're going. You're breaking down through walls, right. hoping that's, you know, that's the right, right. way you backtrack. And it's a roller coaster and they yeah they don't really teach that yeah you'll learn the business plan stuff but if you can't get what's between the ears right none of the other stuff is going to roll out right absolutely and 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 what are your stories right <clears throat> i mean i talked to you know there are, 
a common story with with um, and there, there are many of these kids, I mean, both in L.A., but also a lot, you know, many in Miami, um, first generation. Right. So parents came here. They grew up in countries where entrepreneurship, you know, the idea that I'm going to go sit in my garage and mint an NFT and make millions of dollars is it's not even on the radar. Right. It's not even something that's comprehensible. Right. Um, I've had many friends that have parents that are uh, very discouraging because they didn't just go get a job. They're doing some crazy working for themselves thing. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, which are much more lucrative, right? But right. You, you, you've got to identify what are those stories? What do I really believe about money? What do I believe about success? What do I really believe? Not what do you consciously believe? What do you really believe? Yeah. Deep down. Deep down. And figuring out what is that programming that some of which might be really limiting. Yeah. Um, because if you're trying to be a game changer or you're trying to be, if you want your own life to be improved by something. Yeah, just change the game in your, own, in your own life. You know, start right? there. Your path. Start there and find people. I mean, look, go on YouTube, go to seminars, find people that can help you. The first step is to figure out what are, what are what's your programming? Yeah. What software are you running? Who are, you, who are your mentors? Like, who, who do you look up to? And what are some favorite books that, that you, that were like go to that changed the game in your, you know, in your life? Yeah, I think, um, I think there are a few things. I think, uh, I went to, I went to a course called MITT. I think it's masters in transformational training or something like that. Um, that some, some entrepreneurs in LA had introduced me to, and it's one of these five day courses and it's very intense and it's, you know, half days, two days and full days, three days or something like that. Yeah. But most of the focus is on figuring out what are your stories and um, taking responsibility for um, for the stories in your own head and understanding that, that the story you've been telling yourself might not be right. Um, so trying to get to the core of a lot of this, yeah. whether you're dealing with relationship issues, work issues, life issues, whatever it is, trying to get to be a better version of yourself and free yourself from these shackles. Yeah. Um, so I think MITT and there are some others like MITT and, and there's some other, there's some other teachers that I think, I think Joe Dispenza is, is oh, yeah, I love him. he's great. I think he talks about some of these things. Tony Robbins talks about a lot of, of these things. Um, you know, I think I love people that think for themselves. I love people that are independent. I, you know, I'm constantly inspired and amused by Elon Musk and right. I love watching <laughs> Joe Rogan. Um, and Rand, the, the, you know, the, oh, the Russian yeah. writer was a huge influence on me. Um, mm -hmm. reading Atlas Shrugged right after college made a really big impact on me. Um, Jonathan Haidt is, is a writer. I actually was talking about him uh, this morning at a meeting. He's a moral psychologist that was a professor and has written a book called The Righteous Mind. He wrote a big article um, called The Coddling of the American Mind. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Very so well known. He's doing some really, really interesting work around, and, and I think really important work around trying to kind of de-radicalize everybody and, and, mm -hmm. and try to bring civil discourse and try to bring people back to the middle. Right. in a country that's increasingly polarized. Yeah. Um, I think he's he's been really inspiring, and I think his, his book was really interesting because, you know, he talks a lot in The Righteous Mind about um, what binds us blinds us and things that we hold sacred. We all, there are things that we all hold sacred. Imagine, mm. picture, picture the mother of a serial killer who gets on TV, and we've all, We've seen it, right? Mm -hmm. My son's, my son's, you know, he's a loving boy and he's. I can never like imagine him doing this. 20 people. Yeah. Yeah. Because your, your family's sacred to you. And so you lose mm. objectivity, right? You lose all objectivity over things that are sacred to you. Um, and we all have things like that. Right. So understanding what do you, what, what's sacred to you and where are your blind spots and what are you maybe not objective about? And having people around you who can call you out on those things, you know, and mm -hmm. say, well, look, maybe you're missing something here. Uh, and being open enough and getting rid of your ego and not being so attached to your beliefs and to your positions and everything else to try to listen to other people. And I think that goes for everything in life, man. I mean, whether that's a business yeah. or a relationship or, you know. Yeah, that's Getting powerful. out of your own way sometimes is really powerful. Yeah. Joining a mastermind is also, I think, important like getting that per the, those different perspectives from people who at the end of the day they're there for the same purpose of growth and and helping you see your blind spots is important so you've been 
working with a lot of these companies, film stars, you, you mentioned Gwyneth Paltrow when we were, when we were mm -hmm. talking earlier. Um, what are you doing now? What's your focus now? What are you excited about right now? You know, what I'm really excited about now, I mean, I moved to Miami last summer. Um, I've always been infatuated with Miami since I would travel here as a kid. We, you know, I'd, I'd been here a couple of times as a kid and was just always in love with Miami. I just love the vibe. I love the the beaches. I love the, I actually like the humidity. I love, the, <laughs> I like the tropical weather. Might be one of the few here <laughs> that like the humidity. Um, and so, so, uh, when, when I started seeing, you know, for, for me at least working with, Working in technology and in media, I always felt like, well, what am I going to do in Miami? I'm, I'm not in the I'm not in the hotel business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the tourism not, industry, I'm not tourism. What am I going to do in Miami? Right. And so, so during COVID, when this, there was really this influx of capital, people in tech and in crypto, this really became a crypto hub, and NFTs really started going. Mm -hmm. I thought to myself, you know, I want to go be a part of that. Miami is right. having a, a huge growth spurt. And there you go, putting yourself in in the environment, right? The environment. So that you can cause right. things to happen, exactly. and give yourself opportunities. Yeah, go be a catalyst. And I said, look, I, I helped. I was I was one of the people that was involved in the LA startup ecosystem, and I said I can take those lessons and come apply them in Miami. And that's exactly what's happened. I mean, I think I think what's happening in Miami is incredible. I think uh, I think in large part it's the people, it's the leadership. Um, they're Miami is in a really special place and I think it's it's going to continue growing and I meet people every day that are moving here from other areas that are mm -hmm. bringing experience and they're bringing capital and they're bringing other things that are all the ingredients of having a really thriving right. innovation hub yeah. which is exactly what's happening here and so so that's what I'm working on now I I, I advise I consult um, I still work as a lawyer um, as well working with a lot of web three. So it's a lot of VR, AR, crypto, a lot of NFTs. I, I work with some big NFT projects. Um, and and it's been really interesting to me because web three really is the convergence of media and technology right? yeah. as our NFTs. So this thing that I started doing 20 years ago that my colleagues thought I was crazy for doing ended up being exactly where the world has gone. Um, and I didn't really have that plan. It's just, I liked, media and I like technology. And so it's been an, a natural fit to really evolve into, uh, into someone who can help people build things in mm -hmm. media and technology. And, and in Miami and abroad, I mean, that, that, that for right now, a lot of that is web three, right? We're seeing a lot of these technologies and a lot of these, um, it, it's really, I think it's exciting to see where things are going. I know you've had people on game changers who've talked about NFTs and metaverse and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's it's hugely exciting. I think it's inevitable. Yeah. Um, and we don't know exactly what it's going to look like. We think we know what it's going to look like. Right. But it's like trying to predict. It, you know, it's like being in the '90s and 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 looking at the the internet, right? right? And and the trying dot com and so forth. The effects of Twitter, <clears throat> Instagram, or things like right. That. Yeah. So you know, talking about the past guest, I had Mario Knopf on, uh, and he explained NFTs really well in, in a way that I hadn't heard before. And it, essentially, it's it's not about you know, images and, 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 and art and so forth. It's really around ownership. And, you know, it's just like when you, when you pack up, you know, you move from LA to Miami, you can take your things right. with you and you bring them over in the metaverse. It's the same way when you start owning, let's say a, a, a property or you start owning, you know, a Gucci watch in the metaverse and all this, all, you know, a chain and so forth. That's part of a character. You could, let's say that, you know, in a game, that game shuts down, you still own those things and you bring them forward. It's hard for people to wrap their mind, including myself, around this whole idea of the metaverse, which means right. it's it's just like a, a replica of real life, but in, in digital format. There are people and, and, and companies and DAOs buying virtual real estate mm -hmm. that is just as expensive or more expensive mm -hmm. than it is here in, in real life. Right. And it's... I have so many friends that are just like, I don't get it. You're just buying code. I mean, you're you're buying, but it's all it's a lot of it is around kind of status and, and projecting, right? It's like I own a board ape or I own real right. estate next to the board ape right. yacht club or crypto right. punks or whatever it is. Right. What's what's your view on on the metaverse and NFT and, and digital ownership? Yeah, I I think I think um 
the, your guest described it correctly. It is about ownership. It just happens to be that the initial instances were art and right. things like and digital music. collectibles. Correct. But it goes way beyond that. And it's really about a decentralized system that no one entity controls, that you can have things that are verifiable and secure. And it's about ownership and chain of title. And, uh, a and really not relying market. on a third party to, to right. provide that. Right. right. And not being subject to a third party, right? Which is why we see governments really um, Getting struggling uneasy. with this. Yeah. It's a very, I mean, most of the people that I knew that were really into Bitcoin and crypto, and I think still when you go to the Bitcoin, there's there's a very, uh, there's, a, there's a very libertarian bent to it, right? It's a right. very much, we want it to be decentralized. We don't want Chase or someone else controlling yeah. all the money. We don't want a Federal Reserve controlling all the money. We want it to be decentralized. And so... I think I think there's going to continue to be a push and pull, and governments will continue trying to figure out how to regulate. But in terms of on the metaverse, you know, when people say, "Well, that's ridiculous. Why would I want to live in a virtual?" Look, I already we are I I work with people whose yeah. lives are digital, right? If you're an Instagram influencer, is your life your not life digital? is online for yeah, the most it's part? Your digital yeah. life is your most important life from a revenue perspective, from what people see perspective, right? How many people your image your you're right. Your how, likeness. How many people see a Kim Kardashian in real life and how many people see her virtually? Yeah. You know, the numbers are 99.9% is all Or The virtual. Rock or anybody else, right? 99.9% um, are, are already seeing you virtually. And when people say, well, why would I buy something that's virtual? You know, there are people that spend $20,000 getting verified on Instagram to get a little tiny a few mark. pixels blue <laughs> in your Instagram. Yeah. Um, so virtual reality and virtual, um, existence is already meaningful to people, mm -hmm. right? It, it already matters. Um, your company's website, things like that, where people are doing business, how they decide to work with you, your LinkedIn, this is all virtual, right? right. None of this is in real life. Yeah. So for people that, that are, are kind of skeptic, I'd say we're already on our way there. You just don't realize you're, it. And you're on the train too, <laughs> right? And you just don't, whether you, you don't like it or not. It. That's yeah. why I think that's why I think it's inevitable. It's inevitable. Now, what shape it takes and you know it's kind of like social media became inevitable. Yeah. And in MySpace ended up not being a winner, right? There was a time where MySpace was huge and it was dominant. Was yeah. So you don't know who the winners are going to be exactly. I hope that it will not be one company that that controls mm -hmm. the metaverse. That's a scary world. I don't want to live in that world. I, I would like, you know, I, I think the metaverse should be decentralized and it should not be subject to one company controlling right. it and and whatnot. But you know, in terms of virtual real estate and whatnot, I think, look, I think it's just an extension of what we've been talking about. We're, we're, our digital identities are already hugely important to mm -hmm. most of us. And if you're growing up, your digital identity is more important than your your real identity, right? Yeah. Um, your, your Instagram, your TikTok, whatever is the most, it's, it's more important than what you look like day to day. Right. Or who you interact with day to day. So it's I your brand. It's essentially, your brand. it's your brand. And everyone's going to have their brand that they could either you know do with they can they can modify it they can influence it where do you want to take your brand and and how people perceive you See, but i don't want to get down that that road because then you can say okay people you know i'm i'm putting up a front and that's not really myself and that's a whole nother topic of authenticity that right. we don't have time to get into right. but yeah i see i see where you're going with this but i th i think to your point i think most people i mean look even just in our tradition real lives right people wear masks right yeah everybody does True. everybody wears masks at some point no one is authentic all the time yeah hey how are you doing today i'm good 50 percent of the time i'm not good i'm yeah. stressed i'm exactly. angry i'm fearful i'm whatever there's something else going on we just don't we put on a mask when i'm talking yeah, you about don't want to talk about that and i think look much of that's the same i've worked with a number of influencers and i can tell you real life is not what what it appears to be on social media for the vast majority <laughs> right. of, of talent, of influencers. Um, you know, it's a glamorized version of, yeah. you know, it's, 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 a, it's a caricature. But it's like, to what point will it go? Because now it's, it's just getting so extreme. You know, how much more is it gonna go before, before you're just... Well, I think we're heading toward the metaverse where you will look like whatever you wanna whatever look you like. Whatever you wanna look and like. You'll sound like whatever you wanna sound like and you'll, live wherever you want to live and, and i think um, it's like ready player one it's ready player one I, I don't think we go to the matrix i mean i hope we don't go to the matrix i don't think that's a, <laughs> that's, that's a, a you know that that's a not ideal version of the metaverse 
Um, but but I think we probably go somewhere closer to a Ready Player One. Right. Um, and how how quickly that occurs, I don't know. It's probably five to fifteen years. Yeah. Um, we need technology. We need hardware to get there. Right. I think I think if if Apple can come up with um, glasses that can do AR and VR really well, and they're probably mm-hmm. one of the only companies that really can in a likely scenario do that in terms of mass produce something that's really usable that's as common as an iphone that everybody has that everybody can interact with everybody else Mm -hmm. i think we need that for for the metaverse to really start to come into a fuller effect right um but i think look i think it's inevitable i think i think anyone who's doubting um I, th- I think you're going to be on the kind of the wrong side of history, right? Right. Just the same way if it was the '90s and you were doubting the internet. Yeah. You lost. So start dabbling in it. Just start doing something with it, so you can start learning and getting adapted yeah, to it. You exactly. can't keep pushing it and pushing it under the rug and, and sweeping it under the rug. It's it's going to outgrow us. Absolutely. I think it's got, it's <clears> going to it's going to evolve. It's going to it's going to. We don't know exactly where it's going to go, but yeah. we know it's going to be as important as you know the internet was. Yeah, and um, I think it also creates, you know, especially with respect to your show, game-changing opportunities. Right. I mean, huge, huge opportunities, opportunities. massive opportunity. Imagine yourself knowing what you know now in 1992 or three before yeah. the web really took off. Right. I mean, like, how did I not see that coming? How did you not <laughs> see it? How did you not see Amazon? How did you not see Uber? How did you not see yeah. right? All this stuff. So I think if you can start extrapolating, especially for those people, um, you know, the future doesn't just if, the future doesn't just belong to twenty-year-old entrepreneurs. Yeah. Right? The reality is that there are people that are, that are, that are old enough to have been through you know Web one and two that have a lot of if they apply it, they've got a lot of um, experience and vision mm-hmm. to be able to say, okay, I've seen this movie before. Yeah. And I may not see it. I may not see how it ends, but I know where it's going. Exactly. So I know some of the big plot points and <clears throat> and I know enough to know when to be ahead and how mm-hmm. how to start something to get ahead of the curve. And so I think there's huge opportunity for everyone. And the reality is look, I've got you know, I've got a client that's twenty three and started getting into NFTs when he was seventeen or eighteen and minted a dozen crypto punks for nothing. Right. A dozen, you know, he's got I don't know, eight figures now and crypto punks that Jeez. didn't cost him any money. I mean, when we were growing up, like what opportunities Nuts. existed as a Never. high schooler to make eight figures? Nothing. Never. Nothing. You would you would have had to have been a, a Michael Jackson as a child. Or something right. Like that. Nothing not not even a drug dealer that. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> at that point. Nothing else would provide that kind of <clears throat> opportunity. So there are more opportunities than ever yeah. for people from any walk of life, anywhere in the world, to make money and to get involved. I mean, it's really unprecedented. Awesome. Eric, my brother, thank you for being on the show, man. You're definitely a game changer. You've been changing the lives of a lot of people and, and you will continue doing that here in Miami. How can people reach out to you? Uh, you know what? Go uh, find me on Instagram, Eric F. Galen, G-A-L-E-N. Uh, or uh, I'm at, uh, I guess, give people my email. Right? How, yeah. How do people normally reach out on the show? <laughs> any any way, number out whatever the most effective way is, man. Yeah, go go to uh, gmlaw.com and you can search for me and find me there if you want to email me. And um, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm not, I'm not too hard to find. Cool, cool. If you loved what you heard in today's episode of Game Changers, please subscribe and rate us. The lessons and the stories in these podcasts are immensely valuable. So I invite you to share them with a friend who needs to hear it you may end up being the game changer in their lives.